Mm. All right, good morning. Okay, so three friends from uh, the local congregation were asked, um, when you're in the casket and friends and congregants and members are mourning over you, what would you like them to say? Yeah. So uh, one guy says, well, I'd like them to say that I was a wonderful husband, a fine spiritual leader, a great family man. Oh, yeah, everyone nodded. Mm, yeah, yeah. Another guy says, well, I would like them to say that I was a wonderful teacher, and, and I really did my best to serve God, and, and I made a difference in some people's lives. And people nodded. Oh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. And then they all turned and looked at the last guy and said, you, what about you? What would you like them to say? He said, I'd like them to say, Look, he's moving. <laughs> okay. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a subject that is very interesting to me personally. It's about uh, why fear. Um, some people like to get scared. I don't know about you, uh, but some people really love scary movies, roller coasters, uh, driving fast, uh, picnics in the cemetery. I don't know, but that, you know. When I grew up, I grew up across the street. Uh, we lived across the street from a cemetery. And as soon as I got old enough, uh, we would uh, go play in the cemetery, particularly at night, uh, because we were not supposed to. And that made it enormously attractive. We just knew the most fun in the world was in the cemetery at night. And, um, and you know, we would ride our bikes up and down the, the rows and um, play hide and seek and just do all the normal stuff and basically try to scare each other out of our minds. That's what we did. And you know, the more scared we were, the better fun it was. Absolutely. Um, I don't do that anymore. Uh, you know, uh, that all feels like an awful lot of work. Now, what I notice now, though, in life, the things that scare me are at the same time things that very much attract me. You know, like I'll hear about something new or something I think, oh my God, I want to experience that. Oh, and my first response is, oh, that makes me, I, my first response is, I want to experience that. Then like, oh, that's kind of scary. And then it's like, when can I put it on my calendar? Is sort of how that goes now. Recently, I was reading an article about um, a Zen Roshi, a Zen teacher who had passed. And uh, he had taken um, a group of students to Auschwitz, the concentration camp in, uh, in Germany. And, and they just went for the purpose to be together and meditate. And, and that was really moving to me because, of course, you know, I, I know people who were in Auschwitz. And, um, and so I thought, wow. That, but what the fear that brought up in me, because I, I, so I thought about that, and I thought, well, I've just got to sit with this fear and see what this is about. And I think, because it's like coming almost face to face with what I think of as the big evils. And I know in the science of mind, we don't talk about evil as a power, you know? But, but I thought, oh, God, this sort of grabbed me, set up camp in me, and I know I'm going to have to do that sometime. It's coming, so I've got to start to prepare myself. You know, scientific studies have been done, and people who like to get scared, they, they really do enjoy the fear, you know? So for them, it might, it might actually be fun, but for most of us, I think it works against us. You know, now I know they say fear is false evidence appearing real, and uh, another nice way to say it is when you encounter fear, forget everything and run, things like that. But you know, I think what we do is far worse because we imagine things, and you know, they say, and I believe this is true, that most of the things that we are afraid of, are afraid of, are imaginations that never actually come to pass. Most things that we get worked up about. Oh my God, I'm afraid of the typhoon. I'm afraid of this. You know, I live in the valley. I'm probably not going to be affected by a typhoon here. You know, it just isn't going to happen here. So uh, there's a story of a wise old man uh, who's sitting under a tree in India. And the spirit of the plague goes by. And he asks, uh, where are you going? Asks the wise old man. And the plague says to him, I go to Benares where I shall slay 100 people. Then months later, the spirit of the plague passes by again, coming in the other direction. And uh, the old man says to the plague, he says, you said you would slay 100 people, but you slew 10,000. To which the spirit of the plague responded and said, no, no, I slew 100. He said, fear slew the rest. You know, so I like that because it points 
uh, what it points to for me is how my imagination can run with things in the not good direction. You know what I mean. You know, when we're at home in our spiritual consciousness, you know, there is a lessening of fear, I notice. You know, when I sit at home and I'm meditating and I'm praying and I'm doing my studying, I, I, have, I have no fear, you know. And with a lessening of fear, there's a lessening of the effects of fear. Some people have barely a symptom and they know it's the worst case scenario. I know that's not you, but maybe people that we know. You know, they sneeze twice in a row and they just know they have cancer of the nose. Yeah, they just know it. They know, you know. Now, some people, um, well, rather than, than affirm the spiritual truth that, you know, there is nothing working against me in the mind of God, because that is the truth, you know, or the perfection of God surrounds me, they just know this is it. This is going to be the end. Oh, my God, this is what's going to take me out of the game. You know, they say the only fears that babies have are loud noises and falling. All other fears are learned or developed over time. You say, well, what about my fear of flying or dying or parachuting or getting sick or being alone or on and on and on? You can just fill in the blank for whatever that is. What if your fear is just a bad mental habit? What if we work with that today? That a fear that I may have is nothing but a habit waiting, waiting to be broken. See, I think we can develop new habits because our habits, we say, are always creating our destiny. And so if I don't want a destiny that's filled with here, fear, it would really, really serve me, my life, to develop the kind of thinking habits, the kind of acting habits that don't support that. Your, I think, consider this today, that your mind is like a gallery in an art museum. You know? And there are pictures that line the walls, not unlike our sanctuary. Okay? Uh, but the pictures keep changing in your gallery. And the creative law of our being acts according to those pictures. So for example, our, our body reflects the pictures on the wall of our mind. You know, the creative law assumes new forms and dissolves old forms. So if you scare yourself with a really negative picture, the way out, I believe, I believe what science of mind teaches us is to talk and pray our way out of it, right? Because, uh, when a known, what I'll call frightening situation, does not have, a known frightening situation does not have any spiritual power to hold it in place. You know, and when I can get to that in my thinking, God does not support this. This is not uh, the will of God for me. That is progress. See, God is greater than the appearance. That is progress. I mean, that's something to know all the time. God is greater than this appearance. If we really desire for life to be different, it doesn't take long to completely embrace just one new idea. See, because I think that one idea can completely transform our life. You know, so you get that one, then it's not so hard to accept one more new idea. And then one more new idea. Oh, mm -hmm. um, you say, well, how can one idea really make that much of a difference? Because, well, so what if you accepted an idea like this? Nothing outside of me is in charge of my good because God within me is the source of all good. Now, if we really got a hold of that idea, that's an idea that could absolutely change almost everything in our life. Or I am the consciousness of perfect health. I know a lot of people, if they really worked with that idea on a daily basis, that would absolutely change their experience. I am the love of God, and therefore I am lovable. How about that one? I am the love of God, and therefore I am lovable. You know, it was, um, if that is not the truth for us, and yet we embrace it fully and completely, it would have a huge, huge impact on our lives. See, I think that is um, selecting. That's consciously selecting the pictures that you hang in the gallery of your mind. And so think about this, what's in your gallery? Yeah, there might be some trash, you know, but who knows, there could be Picassos and Van Goghs, you know? There might be dogs playing poker, you know the one, or pool. We used to have an assistant minister here years ago, Reverend Matt, and uh, he was great. And one year for Christmas, he gave me a shirt with the dogs playing poker on it. And I promised him I would never wear it. Yeah, I did. I said, thank you. Thank you for this thoughtful gift. I will never, ever wear this. In all fairness, I gave him a case of spam. 
So, um, you know, it was just the relationship we had. He loved spam. He really did. The guy loved spam. So in your mind, see yourself, you know, taking the picture that you don't want, the poor picture, the sick picture, whatever that is, you know, uh, the diseased picture, the unlovable picture. See yourself taking that off the wall and carrying it over to like a bonfire, you know? And you toss that picture into the bonfire, you know? And we'll say, we could say that that fire is the creative law, you know? And see yourself, as that picture dissolves, hanging a new, better picture on the, on the walls of your mind. See, the new picture stays unless we hang something else. You know, unless we say another fearful or doubt, uh, unless we're saving another fearful or doubting picture for some reason. You know, a negative may flash into your mind, but you know, don't hang it on the wall. Just notice it, like, oh, that's interesting. Like when you see one of those planes with a little message trailing behind it in the sky, say, oh, isn't that interesting? That has nothing to do with me. I am not interested in that at all. You know, Ernest Holmes says in our textbook that what we do when we encounter a negative thought is to pour in the constructive opposite. And I like that because pour in. He doesn't say trickle in or drip in or, you know, get an eyedropper and put one. No, he says pour in the constructive opposite. And so what we do is we state the opposite of the negativity and we state it clearly and as confidently as we possibly can because healing starts the moment that a new attitude is taken. And we can all adjust our attitude because the law has received new directions and begins to act according to what we are now holding in mind. But you know, physical manifestation is the last level of manifestation. It may take time. You know, in the Bible, Job says, though he slay me, I will trust in him. So trust, it is working. One of my very favorite things in the science of my textbook, this is one of the first things I learned, one of the first things I memorized, is where Ernest Holmes says, when we learn to trust the universe, we shall be happy, prosperous, and well. And it's my experience that a lot of people come into science of mind because they feel like, okay, maybe the tools for my life to get better are here. I believe they are. And, uh, and we spend an awful lot of time building faith and trust and greater belief, right? Because our idea of God, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, the idea of God I had was that somebody, you know, God was somebody who sent punishments and, and took delight in pulling the rug out from under you. Right? And so it took me some work coming into science of mind to change that idea of God, a punishing God, a wrathful, vengeful God, to a God that is absolutely love and intelligence. That was a huge step for me. You know, when every once in a while I see that there is a tendency to want to slip back and I have to pull myself forward and say, nope, that was old thinking. I don't believe that anymore. That is not the truth for me at all. See, because it takes time to create a new consciousness. Yes, I believe healing can happen like that. If we are ready, if we are prayed up, healing can happen instantly, but most healing that I've seen happens over time because it takes time to evolve, to heal, to grow, to change our consciousness. But the laws at work beneath the surface from the moment we speak the word, you know, and release our prayer into the infinite mind. You know, the only force that can block it, I believe, is our belief. You know, so if we put our belief on the side, you know, uh, the infinite, uh, you know, the side of the infinite, and, 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 and then nothing can prevent a perfect work from unfolding in our life. See, I think that feelings often follow action. You know, we can talk ourselves out of just about everything. And how we do that is start by taking a step, take an action. The control of the situation we fear is mental, right? That's where where the fear is, it's all in our mind. But we can stimulate the mental by our physical actions, right? So choosing to follow what you know is correct, correct action, will soon make you feel the way you want to feel, which is why I often say, what's the next right thing to do here? What's the next best thing to do here? What's the next perfect loving thing to do here? Sometimes you have to push your feelings to the background and live by your coldly considered choices. You know, the Bible says, choose ye this day who you will serve. So do I choose what keeps me afraid, you know, and give that more power? Well, if I do, then I'm trapped. I'm limited by my own bad choices. So we can choose in spite of our feelings, you know, and what we choose will become the dominant inner pattern of our thought. Again, all good pictures in the gallery. 
people sometimes say to me, they say, well, you know, when I feel bad, I find, it's really, I find it really hard to pray. You know, how can I pray when I feel bad? You know, or I'm just, you know, well, I'm just kidding myself thinking this is going to do some good. That's giving into the feeling. That's giving into the feeling. We are forgetting that they are less real than, than, our, than our reasoning is. See, our feelings about anything are the result of the choices we have made regarding them. Right? So every one of us comes to feel the way we act. So we must act the way we believe, right? or we shall eventually come to believe the way we act. Do you see how that works? If I don't act the way I believe, then I'm going to be then, then ugh, it's going to be the other way. I'm going to believe the way I've been acting. And that's not always good. So years of thinking, others are lucky, you know? Uh, but I'm the unfortunate one. If that's been like your pattern for a long time, or it could be anything else that, that limits you or keeps you small or sick, set the mold, you know, for a new thought, for a new picture. Around and in this mold, our feelings develop. Right? These feelings do not make this the truth about us, but a lie believed will act as though it were the truth. A lie believed acts as though it's the truth. So when we begin to choose differently, the old feelings come up yelling, right? Absolutely, you know, it's, it, because as soon as you start to say, wait a minute, this is different. When we begin to choose differently, the old feelings come up objecting. But remember, the old feelings are in the habit of accepting the false accepting the false belief, accepting the error condition. Understanding the nature of our feelings, you know, we can make our deliberate choices to build a new set of feelings. Feelings follow actions. So sometimes you have to take the action first, right? Select a belief. You pick a belief, any belief in your life, but I'm encouraging you to pick one where you might have some fear or not so much trust. And know right now, know and accept today that God absolutely intends for you, you, yes, you personally, you, to be happy and healthy and have all of your needs met. Let's pray. So thank you. We have turned our attention inward for a moment and just remember that we are surrounded, we are filled with God's infinite loving spirit, that the presence and power of God within us is the most true, most real thing about us. And so in this awareness of our oneness with God and our connection with each other, I claim for each and every one of us that we lay our fear upon the altar today, the altar of consciousness, so that it might be dissolved, released, and let go, never to return again. And the way is made clear for each and every one of us to step into a life where we are more conscious, more awake, more aware, more loving than we have ever been before. I accept this is the truth for each and every person here, that we are not limited by the fears of the past, that we live in tremendous trust that God is good all the time. And so we include in our prayer our family members and friends and loved ones, parents and children, all of those we hold near and dear. And we know right where they are, the fullness, the allness of God's infinite loving spirit is there. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world. So all those situations that pull at our attention, all of those things that would potentially make us fearful, we say God's presence is there as all needs met, as healing, as peace, as reconciliation, as a greater good beyond anything I can even declare. We bless our church. We bless all churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together, that there is raising up in consciousness for all of us. Everybody gets to have healing. And so with an open, gracious, full heart, I give thanks that this is so. I release this word. And so it is. Together we all say, 